Welcome to the London Luminaries, 12 organisations working collectively to share our collaborative history. My name is Rachel Morrison and I'm from Marble Hill. I get the joy of introducing you to our amazing chair. She is the trustee of Pope's Grotto. Uh, she's also a historian, a literary lecturer and an eminent broadcaster. It's Professor Judith Hawley. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you for that uh, generous introduction. And thank you also to other people behind the scenes working to make this series of talks possible. And welcome to you, our audience. It means such a lot to us that we can connect with you uh, via this live uh, Luminaries lecture and also via the YouTube channel afterwards. Uh, the London Luminaries are, as Rachel said, a, a, a group of historic properties. We're in the west of London. And we're trying to bring these properties to life, especially when people haven't been able to visit them very much, by introducing uh, the people and different themes and issues that, that make these properties so interesting. And our theme for this series is poets, painters, patrons and politicians. We're thinking about relationships between arts and artists and the powerful people who back them and sometimes oppose them, as we'll see. And our speaker tonight is going to trace the shift from aristocratic patronage through to a kind of people power that we have today. Our speaker is Tim Corum. And since July 2020, a very good time to begin a new job, when Tim came to Richmond, he's built a new team and a new art service, bringing great contemporary art to the borough, as well as supporting the arts in Richmond through engaging young people and emerging artists. The Art Service Home is Orleans House Gallery, an inspiring context for today's artists. The art collections which are housed in the gallery are the focus of this evening's talk. Thank you, Judith. It's a pleasure and an honour to be part of the Luminary season. It's a tremendous group of people and, and a joy to be part of it. So thank you, Judith. Thank you, Rachel. Um, as Judith mentioned, I, I lead the Richmond Art Service, which does a lot of things across the arts in the borough. But one of my jobs is to direct the development of Orleans House Gallery, which includes the care and development of the borough art collection. Now, I'm a museum and art gallery curator by background and have worked with a number of large and important collections over the years, including some great civic collections at Leeds and Bristol, most recently the Horn Room, before coming to Richmond just a little over 18 months ago. And I'm going to talk today about Richmond's art collection, who made it, what it is today, and a little bit about where it's going. Now, it's a story of continuity and change and of a collection that reflects the changes going on in the world around it. And throughout, I'm going to be using images of works of art in the collection to illustrate the narrative. So if you find the story boring, you can enjoy some beautiful artworks on the way. Um, so first of all, you can see here one of the earliest works in the collection, Jolie's Oil on Paper of Richmond Hill, looking southwest towards the famous view. Now, the view is a consistent theme, as is the Thames in the collection, and both have beguiled artists for, the cent for centuries. I'll also be talking about the way the collection is developing and changing. And as a public collection, particularly, and one held in trust by the borough for the local people. So what is this collection? Well, it's a beautiful set of paintings in the care of the borough, housed and displays at Orleans House Gallery, and also regularly on loan to many galleries and houses across the country, and sometimes loaned internationally. Richmond Borough Art Collection came into public domain in 1962 with a bequest to the people of Twickenham by the Honourable Miss Nellie Ionides of over 460 works of art. This was the founding collection. More about that, more about Nellie, a little bit later on. Just to reassure you, I've had dispensation from the family to refer to the Honourable Mrs Nellie Ionides as Nellie. It's something that um, people locally have, have done colloquially for many years, a sign of affection. Today, um, following um, later requests, individual donations, gifts, and occasional purchases, the collection now comprises over 4,200 items spanning the early 18th century to the present day. The collection is entwined with Orleans House, which was also left to the borough by Nelly, and became the art gallery, which houses the collection, opened in 1972. There are links between the house, which is a long, 
illustrious tragic history and the collection but in truth the collection is more expansive in its scope and encompassing much more um, than just Orleans and like all collections it has its intriguing inconsistencies like for example the Richard Burton archive more of which later essentially though it is an art collection the collection is not in the tradition of many civic collections, which aim to be capsule collections describing a traditional history of Western art. It's best described as containing artworks relating to the borough of Richmond and its people. There's a strong representation of the River Thames, Twickenham Embankment, Richmond Hill, as well as associated sites. There are portraits of the people who've lived and worked in the area. But the local focus of this is only half a story. It also contains artworks of great quality and significance and comes right up to the present day. The one that you can see here is a more recent work, a light box piece made by Emily Allchurch as part of, of a residency in 2002. So let's start with what is a public collection? A public collection's non-profit making. It's permanent. Once things have been acquired, by us, there is a presumption that they'll remain with us and be available in posterity. The collection has to be open to the public and in service of society and its development. It's also dynamic, so the collection never rests, it never settles. It's developed through acquisition, conservation, research and publication, lots of exhibitions. Um, we have, for example, a collections development plan which sets our aims for the purposes of education, study and enjoyment. And in the UK, we are governed by the Museums Association Code of Ethics, which describes this kind of things that we should be doing, the right, thing, the right ways to develop a collection. Many also believe that public collections and galleries should also be democratising, open to many voices and viewpoints, enabling critical dialogues about the past and the future. Now, this beautiful panoramic view of Twickenham was painted in about 1725 by Peter Tielemans, the Twickenham-based artist of Dutch origin. And it's characteristic of the Dutch style of landscape painting, magnificent skies, small figures, everyday subject matter. It's the earliest complete topographical record of the river frontage, a mine of detail about the people and the buildings. It's a social commentary by an artist prepared to paint what he saw. And the picture is essential viewing for those interested in the, nat in the nature of life in Twickenham during the early part of the 18th century. It's a very popular one amongst, amongst our visitors. And you can see the personalities, the two riders illustrate the dress and the style of the 18th century. Um, this really interesting group of, uh, of, of people, the two fishermen sharing what looks like a fish with uh, another of the riders. And then the line of five men um, in working dress, hauling a barge. It's hard, grueling work. And, and when you look at the, the, the painting closely, you can see the leading man is leaning on the ropes, a, clearly a bearded elderly man struggling with exertion. And the backdrop is the, the ground houses of Twickenham, almost all of which have now disappeared. What Tillemans doesn't do is extend his view to the then Secretary Johnson's house, which later became Orleans, and where this painting is currently on show. And I've, I've chosen to, to show this to you now because I think it's emblematic of what the collection is about. It's, que it's clearly about Twickenham. It's also about people and it's of great quality and exemplifies the cutting edge art practice of the day. One minor problem is that Tillman has decided to cut out Orleans House Gallery. So to be a public collection, the collection's got to be shown in an accessible place. And this is where Orleans House Gallery comes in. Orleans House Gallery is based around the remnants of a once fine house on the Thames, built by the politician and all round fixer, James Johnson, who lived um, and then lived in my French royalty and sold on to gravel merchants before finally being saved by an alliance of local people. The gallery here is depicted uh, by Stephen Wiltshire, um, who had his first show, solo show in the gallery in 2003. Just to give you an idea of the gallery interiors, if you haven't visited, this is Gibbs' magnificent octagon room, started in 1718 and completed by about 1720, recently restored. It was an addition to the house originally commissioned by James Johnson, built in 1710. 
The octagon room is surrounded by a series of beautiful gallery spaces, which extend off the, off the octagon room, in what were former buildings in the house. And as well as gallery spaces, we also have a collection study gallery where the collection is shown and can be consulted. It's regularly staffed by our volunteers who are incredibly knowledgeable about the collection. It shows a rotating selection of works in the collection, as well as resources relating to the collection. Our collection in a gallery like this is at the heart of a community. And so in a sense, that's what the point of a public collection is. It's a community's cultural capital. It's what we can draw on when we think about our own sense of identity. It's a lasting repository of collective memories, a lasting impression of communities and their aesthetic values and creativity. Not just things we think are beautiful, but ideas, the values that we hold dear. Some of these can be contested. Some can be the source of inspiration for debate about the past. And some are just an important memory for local people and their communities. The collection is also an important resource for artists and often a focus of contemplation, a place where people can come and use the collection as a way of thinking about their own lives. These are the values of a, of a public collection. So what's the story behind the collection and its home at Orleans House Gallery? Well, set to, to set the scene, we go back to the 1920s when the once great Orleans house had fallen on hard times in the early decades of the 20th century. It's not an unfamiliar story. There's a strong sense at this time that the world is being lost in the face of rapid change after the Great War. Increasing calls um, and conservation of, of what was held valuable in the face of change. A sense of wanting to preserve a way of life that was disappearing. There's also a growing civic culture, the establishment of organisations and co committed to conservation like the National Trust. So in this acceptable context for taking historic places and collections into public trust, Orleans House Gallery became an issue for local people. Now, you can probably see the signature in the corner. This is not a Duncan Grant. It's a copy of a Duncan Grant made by David Bowman. Grant's original is not in our collection. I'd be very happy if, uh, if we could have it. If you know where it is and want to give it to us, that would be tremendous. Um, but I'm about to show this image because it illustrates Orleans House Gallery really at its nadir, its lowest point. Largely demolished and its garden scarred by deep gravel pits. The house had become unviable and the site had been sold to gravel extraction companies in 1926, despite the, the, the efforts of local people. Only the octagon room was saved, along with a small strip of land next to the river. Now, the amazing thing is that from this moment of despair, the land, the buildings and the associated collections are saved for local people by a partnership of local people. So who were they? Who were the people instrumental in the creation of the gallery and its collections? Well, a number of people and it's a partnership and over a long time. So to make a collection, you need artists, you need people to make the work, but you also need builders and collectors, the people who thankfully and hopefully become donors. You need enablers, local people, elected representatives, councils, which provide vision, leadership, resources and support. And you need curators who care for and develop the collection and make it available and, meaning, and meaningful. So here are some of the personalities. So from left to right, you've got Catherine Johnson here, representing the Johnson family, the, the people who built the original house. This rather beautiful portrait is, it is attributed to Mary Beale, one of, her, of uh, only a few women making their living through painting in the 17th century, an artist who's now recognized as one of our great portrait painters. So the Johnsons were instrumental in establishing the house. The next portrait is one of Queen Caroline um, with her son, William Duke of Cumberland. Now, the reason the octagon room was created was as a party room, a space for welcoming and celebrating. Um, and it's believed that it was, it was created largely to court the new Hanoverian dynasty, and particularly uh, Queen Caroline. So Queen Caroline is an important person in this story. If you have a chance to come to the, to the gallery to look at the, the portrait. It is, it is truly beautiful. The iridescence of the, of the embroidery on the dresses is truly wonderful. It's worth seeing in person. 
And then the next person that, that you can see on the side is somebody called Dr. Jo John Rudleeson. He was a physician and polymath and president of the Literary and, and Historical Society in Twickenham for 30 years. He became Charter Mayor of Twickenham and Rudd Leeson helped create a sense of pride in Twickenham. It's committed to both valuing the past and building a future. The municipality chose the phrase looking backward and looking forward as its motto, partly uh, in response to um, Rudd Leeson's commitment to the past and to the, and to the, uh, and, and to the growing municipality. The next person, um, um, key person in this story is somebody called Noel Viner Brady. And he's represented here by a plaque, which is visible um, when you go to York House. Brady led the York House Society, which is still active today um, in preserving the historic, historic character of Twickenham. And um, the society in Brady successfully saved the mansion York House in 1923. So when Viner Brady, bolstered by all of the, the, the work and the support that the, um, the local um, district council had done through the work of Dr. John Reason, when Viner Brady heard that Orleans House was up for sale, I mean, he was very keen to ensure that it was saved. It was said that he had all things in place. He negotiated sales in the land, four parcels of land um, to, be, to be purchased. Um, but overnight, the land was sold to a gravel extraction company. But all was not lost. So the last person on the slide, the Honourable Mrs. Ionides, Nelly, had bought Riverside a house earlier in 1926. Must have been horrified at the prospect of, of a gravel extraction for moving in next door. And Along with Viner Brady's intervention, this led to Nelly purchasing one area and saving the octagon room, along with the remnants of the house and the site. And the society, along with Nelly's help, purchased the area, which is now Audience Gardens, which is the area next to the river for the council. And so these are the people together that enabled the house and the collection um, to be secured for, um, for the area. Now, now, of all of these people, the person most, most closely associated with the collections is Nellie Oyenides. So let's talk about Nellie and the foundation of the collection. So Nellie, Nellie's family, um, she came from a family which was really engaged in civic life. Her father came from humble origins, but may, became uh, Lord Bearstead and in fact, Lord Mayor of London, founded the Shell Oil Company. So a very powerful person, but very committed to uh, the civic um, um, civic life. Um, Nelly, like many people, was a passionate collector. She started with autographs, apparently, when she was a young girl, um, but led on to become an expert in Chinese ceramics. And she used her skills in collecting and her clear feel for the quality of work to amass an impressive and, new co and unique collection of artworks relating to Richmond and Twickenham. Many of these were bought from well-known auctioneers in the 20s, 30s, 40s, and 50s. But Nelly also picked up work from all sources, and it became widely known that if you had an image of Twickenham and wanted to sell, Nelly would be interested. Now, the image that we're looking at at the moment, the painting we're looking at at the moment, is the one that we believe she most prized in the collection. It was originally thought to have been a portrait of Pope, um, and anecdotally, um, it's thought that Nelly really prized this because he, she was understood to have hunted it down and seized it against stiff competition. So Nelly had three circumstances become the owner of a beautiful house in the woods and a growing collection of important artwork. Now, as early as the 1940s, we know that Nelly was thinking about the future and looking to place both the octagon room and the buildings of Orleans and her collection into public ownership. Now, it wasn't the done deal that the house would be given to um, Richmond Borough. At one time, Nelly had agreed to give the site to the National Trust. There's an interesting extract, which I'll read from diaries by James Lee Mill, who worked for the National Trust in the 40s, building their portfolio of houses. Lee Mill says, I went to Mrs. Ionity's house in Twickenham at 9.30. It was very foggy, and so couldn't see much of the riverside scenery. Mrs. Ionides owns the grounds of Old Orleans House, now pulled down, and Gibbs's beautiful octagon, which she showed me. It's well preserved. She offered to leave it and eight acres, which adjoin Marble Hill, including a building which contains two derelict flats. Before I left, she offered to include her pictures of Twickenham, including a Zuccarelli, which Kay Clark wants for the National Gallery. 
The offer is certainly a worthy one. She is a highly intelligent old woman. I liked her. <laughs> so it's interesting, isn't it, that, um, that the National Trust were interested. Slightly in, more interesting that um, there was clearly a, a Zuccarelli that, that um, Kay Clark had his eye on. But, but, but also slightly um, amusing that, um, that, that uh, James Lee Mills sees uh, Nelly Onidis as, a, as a, an old woman at this time. She was far from it. Um, so anyway, a little bit of an insight into the way that um, um, Nelly was beginning to think about passing the collection on, um, e even in the 40s. Now, we aren't sure why the deal fell through the National Trust, but it did. It's likely that the buildings and collections were not in good enough state for the Trust to take them, um, to take them on, even with the promised assets. And so by 1962, Nelly had become convinced that the best way of preserving Orleans House Gallery in her collection was to give it in trust to the council. Um, this resulted in a bequest which included the octagon room and adjacent buildings, along with the collections of artworks. The bequest was debated by council in January 1963. Now, it wasn't a done deal. Don't forget that Twickenham was just about to be absorbed into the new Richmond Council. Many of the urban district council councillors were a bit nervous about taking on uh, new projects at this stage. And don't forget that this was still a period when many councils were, were very underfunded. So many weren't convinced that it was a good idea. You can see from this image here that the, the gallery buildings were in a poor state of um, um, condition. And, and actually, we also know that the, the collections needed a lot of work and conservation as well. So it's, it's a considerable, um, you know, it was considered a certain risk taking on um, this bequest. And the vote was tight, but in council, it was agreed by 20 votes to 17 to accept the collection. And from January 63, um, the house and the collection came into the ownership of Richmond Borough Council. And that's when it becomes a public collection. Ten years afterwards, it takes some time to build an art gallery. Um, ten years after, in 1972, the New York Gallery was opened with its founding collection. The great and the good turned up, um, and, and there was a grand opening. And you can see um, Mr. and Mrs. Um, Panufnik, um, later Sir and Lady Panufnik, standing in front of the very image, uh, a very painting which Nelly had loved so much, along with the mayoress, or the, rather the mayor at the time, and in the background, Toby Jessel, um, who was MP um, for Twickenham for some time, as, was a big champion of, um, of, of the bequest. So the story of the establishment of a public collection really is, begins with collectors and enablers. But from 1972, the collection was carried forward by the curators and the collection developed a new life and a new identity. This beautiful painting by Osmond Kane is one of the first that the new team at the gallery um, collected back in the 1970s. And it shows a new vision for collecting, which focused on people as much as sites and buildings. Kane was, a, um, Kane was a local artist, um, born in Manchester, but he taught at Twickenham College of Technology, where he founded its graphic design school. And this, this work is, is so eloquent and, and beautiful and very much loved by visitors. Um, and, you know, it, the, 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 it's, a, it's, a, it's a beautiful painting. Um, and a great addition to the collection and signals a beginning of, of a, a, a new way of thinking about the art collection. Um, the collection continued to grow and take on new life with the addition of some large individual donations. George Payton left the single largest group of works in the collection. The Barnes-based local historian George Payton amassed a large and very significant collection of books, photographs, prints and artworks, and he donated this to the borough. Many of the prints that you'll see reproduced in Luminary's talks are actually from the Peyton collection. Um, a huge number of prints of places across the Richmond borough. Now, I've chosen these two because they, they both show Peyton's interest in local events and local people. 
Um, on the left is an oil attributed to Archibald Webb, probably by his son James Webb. It shows the um, it shows the old 1827 bridge, um, Hammersmith, um, when it was being replaced with the current one. Now I'm, I'm sure Payton would have been fascinated by the recent bridge closures and would have taken pains to record and document it as an impact and the impact on the local people. Now, so many images of the Thames um, in this collection are romantic or picturesque, but here Webb shows the Thames in a different light with a realism, focusing on the more uh, utilitarian nature of the river. The other image on the screen is again from the Payne collection and is a photo of a uh, photograph of Alfred Walter Williams, um, who was a, a local artist. Um, from a very renowned local, uh, local um, family of local artists. And I wanted to show this to you because it's such a beautiful photograph. It gives you a sense of the kinds, uh, the kind of, the kind of person, the kinds of, uh, the, the, the way that the artists would have traveled out um, to create their new work, their works at this time. Both of these objects offer an insight into the life of local artists in the mid 19th century and just remind us of uh, Peyton's breadth of collecting. Now, I mentioned the Burton collection um, earlier on. Um, another um, significant uh, addition to the, the, the Burroughs collection was the Burton collection. Isabel, Burton, uh, Burton's wife, the wife of the famous and controversial Victorian explorer, sold her husband's archive to the nation so she could afford to create the tent-shaped mausoleum in, uh, in St Mary's Mortlake, which both she and Richard are buried in. As a consequence of these, this transaction, the archive and collections of personal effects came to Richmond. The archive included this beautiful painting by Frederick Layton, of the Burton's house in Damascus. It's very unlike Leighton's work, uh, much more like a, a sketch um, made by the artist for Burton, um, who he was a close friend with. And it depicts um, this lovely uh, Damascan house. The collection also contains some personal effects, including Burton's boots, uh, particularly evocative. Um, and again, the collection is often used by artists and researchers. Burton has a charisma which, uh, which extends well beyond his death and, and people are still fascinated by the man. As well as individuals donating to the collection, the support of art funders and charities has also been very important. Notably the, the Lottery Fund, but also the Art Fund have, have been big supporters. And in 2009, the gallery had come up, had, had, uh, had, had, had become a runner-up in the Museum of the Year Award. Now, the art fund which sponsored the prize would be given a beautiful collection of paintings amassed by a discerning collector called Arthur Grogan. Now, instead of the, the cash prize, the gallery accepted a beautiful set of paintings, including this one. Um, there are eight works in total in the Grogan collection. And this, this beautiful image of um, the mother and child by Arthur Hughes is, is again, a real favorite amongst the visitors. Um, the artist Arthur Hughes first hung a picture at the Royal Academy when he was just 17. So a really precocious talent. And from then on, he contributed almost annually to the great exhibitions in, in London. Um, he wasn't part of the Pre-Raphaelite Pre Brotherhood, but he was very close to the Pre-Raphaelites um, and lived, lived his life in London, um, died in Kew Green and is buried in, in Richmond Cemetery. But again, this painting just demonstrates um, another way that the, the collection is, is developed. Now, all collections have their stars, and this is one of ours. This is Corot's Pre de Londres. It's one of our most requested and published works in the collection. Cor is clearly a star. Um, he's one of the, the, those names that people know. Um, this is one of only three paintings um, known to have been painted by Coro um, during his trip to London in 1862. And it shows Richmond Riverside from the Middlesex Bank, um, showing Hotham Heron House, um, now eBay's headquarters. Um, it's a really beautiful painting. And again, if you come to the art gallery to see these, you'll get a lot more out of them. Um, but hopefully you can see even here um, this beautiful characteristic landscape, this late coral landscape with these subtle rendering of reflections on the water. Um, a lovely restrained palette as well, contemplative mood. And again, expressing two views of Richmond, the urban and the rural, the town and the river. Um, a really beautiful painting. Now, a public collection would be nothing without the public, and, and anecdotally, this is the public's favourite. 
um, a stunning painting again. Um, this is Twickenham by Moonlight by William Pether. It's often cited, uh, as I said, by visitors as their favourite work. Um, Pether, like his father, was known as Moonlight Pether. Um, so renowned for their moonlit works. Uh, I can see why this is so memorable. It, 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 it seems otherworldly to me. Um, it's, it's picturesque and romanticised. Our visitors, I think, often feel they're seeing something secretive and nocturnal in this, in this image, with St Mary's on the left and Eel, Pyle on the right, but the Thames illuminated um, by the moon, the centre stage, again, with that lovely, lustrous um, water. So again, this is very much the, the people's favourite painting. Another great favourite, um, something that we, we show a lot in exhibitions is watercolour, so it's not out on permanent display, but it's often shared in exhibitions, is this lovely watercolour view along the Thames, including Orleans House on the right of the painting. And, but the, the focus is Swan Upping, which is um, this tradition that dates back to the 12th century still takes place every year, although I believe it, we did miss a year because of the pandemic. Um, but it's the annual census of the Swan population on the Thames. When the monarch, along with the vintners and the dyers, livery company, travel up the Thames, lifting and checking the health of the swans before returning them to the water. So a very famous local event, um, captured by a lot of, um, of artists and uh, frequently um, is seen in the collection, this, this particular event. But again, this is a particularly beautiful rendering of it. The, 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 the reflection on the, on the water are beautiful, the placement of the, of the figures. And, and the beautiful sky. So, so again, a, a, a beautiful work. So recent developments um, in, in the collection. Um, so over the last 10 years, the gallery has seen some major improvements, largely supported by the National Lottery Heritage Fund, um, particularly the conservation of the, the collections. Um, as I mentioned, the, the collections were in a not in a terrible state, but they needed a lot of conservation when they were um, conservation when they were when they were passed over to the, to the the borough. Um, and so, over the last ten years, the conservation and the storage of the collections has been improved. The buildings have been transformed uh, with a um, a stunning um, redevelopment, um, and really are very very high quality spaces now for the showing of of artworks. And but perhaps more importantly, the digitization of the collection has been has been um, completed. And so all of the collections, um, all of the images which you're, you're seeing this evening can be seen on our website. They're, they're, um, they're, they're, and there are details of the collection. So this has really opened up the use of the collection. And one of the most exciting things about these, the, these developments is the personalization of the collection and also the ability for people to respond to and have their say about the collection. So one of the fascinating things that happens when you open up a collection digitally is that it, it becomes used in so many different ways. And I really enjoy reading visitors and volunteers comments on the collection, which again uh, are reflected on our website. The galleries continue to collect um, focusing on, a, on adding contemporary works to the collection all the time. And this light box piece is one of an early uh, career series by Emily Allchurch. Allchurch worked in a number of towns and cities um, on this series, exploring the urban landscapes presented um, far beyond, allegedly, the tourist trail, often emphasising the mundane and empty and potentially threatening spaces. Now, all the images in the series are subtly altered using digital software to heighten the atmosphere and tension within the scenes. Um, and the fact that this is a light box adds more to the staging the theatricality of the piece. Um, what's interesting about this particular work is that unlike the others in this series, All Church has gone out of her way to show a classic river view, far from um, what might be considered a, a threatening urban landscape. But actually in the way that she does, that she highlights something of the mundane, something of the tourist trap and the telescope with its slightly threatening implications of surveillance. So the collection continues to develop and evolve and change. And every time we collect, we find that artists are fascinated by, this, by some of these same things, the, the, the views, the Thames, um, but always representing them in a way which is new and, and associated with the concerns of the contemporary time in which we're working. The other thing I wanted to talk about, about the collection um, and how it's, uh, it's being developed over the last few years is, is about the dynamic development of the collection 
through collaboration and public engagement. So one of the exciting things about a public collection is that it does take on a life of its own. It's much like a garden. Um, curators try to manage it, but it's a dynamic system. It's constantly changing. Sometimes it's quite difficult to control. So we continue to reflect the lives and concerns of the people of Richmond through the collection. And for, so, for example, um, Art Unlocked was an exhibition which we opened last year. It was the first exhibition following lockdown's end in summer 2020. It was an open show where local artists could show their work they created in response to the pandemic. And this photo records a den built in the Orleans Wood by two local children, two young artists potentially working with their father who become jobless as a result of the pandemic. So really evocative work, but how do you collect this kind of work? It's often ephemeral and usually it's the idea and the emotion of the moment that is the most important characteristic of, what, of, of the artwork. So for this particular show, we decided to document all of the works and record them. Um, as, as a record of the impact of the pandemic on local, local lives. And this, and this photograph is one of the things that we've collected. Our collecting today reflects the times we live in. Concerns about our sense of identity in the past, climate change and ecological breakdown, our relationship with the natural world. The representation in the collection of people, of artists whose voices and work have not been valued women artists, artists with disabilities and artists of colour. All of these things are really important to the way that the collection is developing. We are also really interested in emerging artists and supporting artists in their career. And so what we're doing now is that is reflecting in the collection current art practice, new art forms, digital and time-based work, art that happens in the public realm. We don't have very much money. Um, so when we collect, often it's related to the, the programmes and the project that we're doing. We often commission and document work. Often the work is collaborative and it involves working with communities. This example is a, it, this image is a good example. It's of a wall piece on Heath Road Railway Bridge on the foot tunnel in Twickenham. It was made by the artist Bryony Ben Jabbat in 2021 as a result of a residency at, at Orleans House Gallery collaborative work with children from Twickenham's Waldgrave uh, School and scientists at the Grantham Institute for Climate Change. It's part of a wider collection of murals designed by young people highlighting climate change conferences, uh, conference at, uh, at Glasgow, COP26. Bryony writes about this, and I just use Bryony's words now. Much of our time was spent in the beautiful woodlands at Orleans House Gallery exploring the life of a single oak and how it is in interconnected with the wider human and non-human community. While the scientists revealed the invisible communications all around us, above and below ground, and highlighted the importance of roots and fungi, I supported the students to reflect upon these new insights through sketching, painting and poetry. The resulting mural, Take the Time, is their response to the biodiversity and climate emergency. So we're exploring how we can record this work as part of the collection at the moment. It's an important moment in our lives, clearly, um, and involves a wide group of people in creating a high quality work by recognised artists. So it's really important that we find ways of, uh, of recording and adding this work to the collection. But it's not as easy as just buying something that's uh, an oil on canvas. Doing justice to the, the complex relationships, the collaborative work, the, the discussions that went on behind this are very, are very complex. And so, so the essence of the collection reigns true to the original foundation, which is about high quality work representing visual arts practice and helping people tell the story of Richmond. Um, but it's constantly shifting and constantly adapting with new concerns and new technologies, new practice. Now, finally, I just wanted to say how dynamic the collection is. It's not static at all. Most recently, Himali Singh Soin has created an immersive exhibition called Brow of a God, Jaw of a Devil, which is currently on show at the gallery. And Himali has chosen to focus on the Burton collection, presenting it in, in an alternative way, reading the archive, not as evidence of the achievement of a well-known Victorian explorer, but as a way of exploring our relationship with the landscape. It's fully immersive with sound, as well as really interesting text that Himali has written. It's interactive and reaches into the collection as well as extending across the site to the banks of the nearby Thames through its, all of its associated activities.
So we're still pondering how we can add such an immersive artwork to our collection, but we're really keen on trying to do so. It seems like a clear contender for the collection, reflecting current art practice, global concerns, and the lives and people of Richmond. So after rattling through at breakneck speed 400 years of art, social history, and local government reorganization, we find ourselves in the present. A huge amount of change, no doubt, but all with continuity. What we do now builds on the work of previous people who developed the collection. And like all who've gone before, the current custodians, Richmond Art Service, are passionate about the collection and its continued connection with people. It'll continue to celebrate art and its ability to record collective memory and help us reflect on the past and enable, and enable us to think differently about the future. Now, if you'd like to visit, um, and I, I do urge you, if you can, to do so, because it's uh, um, seeing the, the, the paintings in the flesh, seeing the work in the flesh is, is really important. Um, we are in Twickenham and we're free to enter and we're open almost every day apart from Mondays. So we'd be really, uh, we'd really love to see you down at the gallery if you can make it. Um, if you'd like to be more involved, um, we have um, a, a, a big volunteering program. So there are many op opportunities to become involved at Orleans House Gallery, whether that's working in the galleries themselves or supporting some of our, our other engagement or research work, we're really interested in volunteers. So, um, so contact us at the website if you can. Um, and so I'm gonna hand back now to Judith, who is going to, I think, talk a little bit about um, the programme. Thank you so much, Tim, for that absolutely fascinating talk. If you are interested in what Tim was saying about the, the neighbourhood of Twickenham and, and Richmond, and you want to hear more, do please attend the other talks in the series. The list of the forthcoming talks is on your screens now. And all of the previous talks, including talks from, from other series, are available on our YouTube channel.